Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 240, featuring the second installment of my interview with Chuck Chuckles Boucher. In this part of the interview, we focus in on the Jawbreaker Pac-Man controversy. Uh, then we talk about what it was like porting all of these games, all these different systems like the C64, the Atari 400. And then, of course, we talk about Chuck's most popular and well-known game, Auto Duel. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chuck Boucher. Uh, so what about Jawbreaker 2? Uh, what's the story behind that? Interesting that you should ask. I was uh, actually just going, kind of going around with uh, on Wikipedia. There, there, some of the, uh, the, 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 the stuff, the information, they, they, my historical stuff typically isn't, is, is like only 60% right. And I feel kind of weird. Only 60% right. Wow, what kind of stuff do they have wrong on there? Well, I mean, Chuckles the Clown. I was there, there was never any Chuckles the Clown as far as I was concerned. But everybody wants to make that connection. I, I think it might have been a 70s variety show character or something. But uh, there was no Chuckles the Clown influence in my choosing Chuckles as a computer, as a pseudonym. Completely wrong. And you'll find that everywhere. Jawbreaker 2... I was looking at the entry, somebody, something came up, somebody had done an edit, and I guess I might have done an edit, before, an edit on the Wikipedia article for that, and so I got a notification. I was looking, it's like, this doesn't look right, and, and at this point, I don't even, I, I think there is confusion over the, ver the computer versions, because my, remember, my, my memory of Jawbreaker was that it was designed and programmed for the Apple II by John Harris. And I don't think he's credited on Wikipedia for that. Um, and then there were other versions possibly done by other people. Or it might have been that he did, ah, maybe he did the Atari VCS version and someone else did the Apple II version. That could be it as well because he was doing VCS games. Anyway, uh, that was one of the first lawsuits. They were sued by, uh, online systems was sued by Atari for Pac-Man infringement over Jawbreaker 1, which was very Pac-Man-esque. <laughs> Online won the lawsuit, and so they were not required to stop, stop selling the product. But Ken Williams, um, if I remember right, wasn't comfortable with the whole, I mean, he had to defend his uh, business, but he, even when it was all said and done, the way I remember it is he wanted to re-release it so that it wasn't as much as similar <laughs> trying to tread the tread the great walk carefully here um so basically he had a, a design in mind to instead of making it a maze game we just had the horizontal levels we were still keeping the teeth and then the collecting the dots and the candies and all of that and and basically he had this this uh design in mind that he tossed to me and so I implemented pretty much so I, I can't even claim I mean even that one I what I did what I can claim is those giant rotating faces were tricky to do because there was a lot of pixels to be moving on an Apple II at the time well at any time it was always I guess maybe later it went no I think it was always just a one megahertz 8-bit processor with uh, integer math and 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 mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, that was the first game you converted for Atari, or convert? That's, was that the first game you converted for the Atari? I actually, uh, yes, it is. I wrote the first version on the Apple II, and then I did an Atari. I think I also did the Commodore sixty four version as well. Those were way easier because you had sprites. You had the graphic support on those systems were was way better. And then he later became the the port portmeister with all these different uh, platforms. I'm just kind of wondering if you could describe each one briefly, just from your point of view back then, and you know which one was the most challenging, which did you like the best? Oh, each the platform or port? Oh, the platforms. The platforms. Um, they each had their ups and downs. If I remember right, the uh, you, you know I was just happy to have the graphic processors in either one of them. Um, Talking about I, the Atari 400, 800, and the VIC-20? Yeah, uh, no, I didn't do any VIC-20 work. It was Atari 400, 800, and they had character mapping. I don't think, 
I can't remember if they had actual sprites, but the, you did have a level of indirection there that, that you could uh, kind of instance your graphics and move it around, just give it a coordinate and draw it. Um, I honestly can't even remember how that was done. Um, where the Commodore 64 was far better in that respect, you could design proper hardware sprites. I don't know what you got, 32 by 32 pixels or whatever, and you just define those once and then you can, um, you know, you just move it around the screen with an XY coordinate instead of redrawing all the time. And it turns out that going from the Apple II to either one of those systems, since they had the hardware support, it wasn't terribly difficult. There was some manipulation, pixel manipulation, um, with the with the graphics format because the Apple II had a really weird seven bit per seven color bit per byte layout, and these others were much more straightforward. Uh, you know, you set up you know either sixteen bit color or four bit color or I, I don't even remember if we had two hundred and fifty six bit color. Um, but it was far better to go in in the direction from the less primitive graphics to the uh, uh, the less advanced graphics hardware to the more advanced graphics hardware. And that's the approach I took as far as the port ports go. It's kind of interesting because we would kind of go around a little bit. These things would go through testing as they're ready to be released and I would get a bug report back and the first thing I would do is say check it on the Apple II. Because I started with that Apple II source code and it would get ported bugs and all. You know, and, and as often as not, Yes, it was a bug that was existing in the uh, that was already there in the first place. So we'd have to fix both. And they yeah. and they had sound. That's right. Both of them had far better sound capabilities. Apple II, you got a one. It, it you couldn't even call it a one bit sound output. It was it, you would write to a memory register, and it would toggle the position of the speaker. So you didn't even know if it was in or out. You just knew that writing to it would change it. Did you do any work with the Mockingboard? Very little. I, I didn't do. I, it, yes, I did, and I didn't. Any. I didn't release anything commercially with it. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that you liked working on the Ataris and the C sixty fours because you know, I've had a lot of other. Well, maybe not a lot, but you know, several other developers on, and they say that they just really love the Apple II. That it was their. Uh, I don't know if they just. That's just what they liked, or was there a technical reasons why they preferred to program on that? Hard to tell. What were they doing? Were they playing? Or well, Richard they Garriott being an example. Oh, he preferred the Apple II. Well, maybe he didn't. <laughs> uh, I just remember. It, I seem like it, I remember him telling me that he stuck with the Apple II. And but that's still, what he started with, and he always had people to do the ports. Um, and it, it, pretty early on, he started bringing in people to do the. You, you know, he started doing more design and bringing in programmers to do the programming anyway. Um, I can't even remember when that started. I mean, I did early contract work for him. Um, I know that he did a lot of the programming, if not all of it, in Ultima 3, maybe Ultima 4. He started hiring people on. Hard to remember. But... but uh, there weren't any conversations behind the scenes like, you know, Richard, why don't you try the C64? Oh, which one's better? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, I think he was just more focused on making the games than which platform. You know, again, figures, why change? I, I, I can do this here. <laughs> Maybe we should, you know, let's back up a little bit uh, to when you founded or co-founded Origin Systems uh, with, the, with the Garriots, right? So you were one of the original... Origin Originals, I guess. Yep. So is this a tough decision, or were you eager to jump on board? A little bit of both. It, uh, you know, we all, we didn't, we didn't have any venture. We started the company without any venture capital, so uh, you know, we, we were all just writing our own checks for that. And so the that was a lot of money for me back in 1983. But at the same time, it's... How much money was it? Oh, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I don't know if that's been published. I'll keep it under wraps. But but it was a, a substantial sum anyway. Well, it was a substantial sum for us. 
in the grand scheme of things, it was shockingly low. <laughs> uh, the, 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 all, the, what we started that company on, um, well, well under a million dollars, um, got our origin started. But but um, it's kind of all that I knew when I was young. I didn't have any, you know, I had no responsibilities, no kids or real estate. You know, I didn't have, or did I? Actually, I had bought a, I had bought real estate before we started Origin. Um, is that right? No, I had not. But it came quickly it, the, the, thereafter. That that uh, it's like okay, I can afford to buy a condo, <laughs> but uh, with a mortgage, of course. But but uh, you know, I was twenty three years old. How scary can it be? <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> braver man than me uh okay so you did you, i guess you kind of took over doing the ports for uh, these ultimate games right ultimate two and three i was looking at an earlier interview you did and you said that the really challenging one was the atari and you had to make some cuts uh to the original games so i'm kind of wondering what it was that made it so challenging and then how did you decide what to cut out i actually don't even remember that uh this was a 1985 interview for a Atari, one of the Atari magazines. Oh gosh, cuts! To <laughs> but you, know, you don't remember every detail from your every <laughs> <laughs> eighty-five interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, I if I had to guess, you know, it could only be two things. I mean, we shipped on floppy disks, so you can partition the data. So maybe only one. Maybe you just didn't have the RAM for the Atari available at one time and and so we had to massage things to accommodate that I can't even remember because if it was data on the floppy disks and unless we were bound by a uh, you know keep it to one floppy disk on two sides kind of thing and that was a realistic constraint back then too that that could have been it but I can't remember how much data was on a Atari floppy. In the interview, you said you did this the whole Ultimate Three port in just three months. Does that sound right? Sounds, sounds about right. We would do whole games in uh, in a matter of months, and, and yeah, I, I, that sounds sounds about right. Again, I was starting with a complete game, and it was already programmed. The uh, both the, they all all of the Apple II, the Atari, the Commodore sixty four all used a sixty five hundred two CPU, mm -hmm. and these programs were written in assembly language. So really, all you had to do was you slice and dice the memory map to make it fit, and then you have to reprogram the disk I/O and the graphics and the sound. But all the game logic stays the same. So once once you have a core, uh, say, graphics engine. The bulk of the work is done, and 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 also, by that time I had done a couple of other ports, so I had some of the routines already. I had my data transport tools done, and so yeah, that sounds about right. Three months. So what's the story, uh, the behind the scenes story about Chuckles, the court jester in Ultima series? Was this a shocker for you, or oh, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. That that's real. That's there. I mean, that goes back to uh, uh, I guess Ultima, one of the early uh, Ultimas, one or two or something. But that's when Richard and I were hanging around, and I was all kind of I, I was. I, 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 that's maybe that that's my alter ego. I see myself as kind of the nutty guy anyway, and so a kid at heart, and so to be the uh, court jester. Kind of hanging around. Chuckles the jester, not to be confused with Chuckles the clown. Exactly, they're different. But uh, Chuckles the jester, annoying Richard. Yeah, that's <laughs> I couldn't blame him for that. <laughs> so, what were these? Uh, what inspired the antics and the little taunts and everything, the riddles and such? Do you collaborate with him on those, or oh, no? Just... No, it's all it's always all his own. At the time, he was throwing a lot of friends in in the. Um, games as well. I mean, Dupre, I don't know how long he was around, probably forever. And and uh, th 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 that was a buddy from SCA. And Yolo, the bard, same thing, buddy from SCA. I don't know how many other regular characters go back to the early, early Ultimates. 
All right, so around 1985, we get your magnum, magnum opus, <laughs> Alto Duel, which I did a match that on. I love the game personally. And it's based on a Steve Jackson game, uh, I guess a board game or pen and paper game. I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, Car Wars, right? Car Wars. And uh, they did, they, there were some legal problems there that uh, resulted in them changing the trade, the, 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 the property to auto duel and and so at the same time that he was changing car wars to auto duel we, we released auto duel as the computerized version so you actually worked with steve jackson or talked to him i did yeah worked with steve um originally even that one's kind of uh you know it, it's i could have some of the details wrong but my recollection is that he had envisioned more of a step, uh, a turn-based computer implementation of the board game. And uh, where I was thinking more real, you know, interactive, dynamic graphics. And I think the way it turned out, it's like, it's like, Steve, no, it needs to be this way. We can't release a turn-based game. Trust us on this one. And I, I, I as far as I, I, I remember having, I believe I had Origin. Well, I, they wouldn't have released it if they didn't have, you know, the backing from Richard and Robert. Um, but they're like, trust us, we need to make this interactive. And uh, when it was all said and told, I think it was far happier with it than he um, was with the when, with what he saw initially and what what he saw as we were making the game. What kind of guy was was Steve Jackson? Or I mean, what what was it like working with him? Was he Friendly or particular, <laughs> meticulous, <laughs> opinionated? Then. Uh, definitely opinionated, not uh, real volatile. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've dealt with Steve a little bit, you know, here and there over the years. He's always kind of instructs, he's kind of understated, um, sits back and makes his case kind of, kind of, Guy, very he, he has very strong uh, opinions and very strong design opinions, uh, and justly so. Um, and and so no, it, it was it was all fine working it through. So he was happy with the finished product. Then he was happy with the finished product. Yeah. So you wanted to do this game because you were a car nut in real life, right? Oh yes. Okay. Hot rodding or, or what? Where did you get that research? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a 1986. No, I don't. Uh, it, <laughs> I just came across this somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've always been, uh, you know, lately I call myself a latent car nut. As I was, when I was younger, I had lots. I, I, I would almost always have a regular car and some kind of sports car, which was, which required some kind of work. I drove British cars and it's trying to spit fire through high school and, and, and old Chevys. And so I was always working on stuff. And so that, that aspect of it definitely appealed to me. Um, so you yeah. had machine guns mounted on flamethrowers. Not yet. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great, uh, it, it, opportunity also re remember this was when did we release that uh 86, 85 85 yeah, somewhere around in there. and when did road warrior come out this is oh that's a good question i it's on well, the, the first one was just called mad max right yeah yeah but it's definitely yeah. inspired well it must have been early 80s auto duel and it, 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 and car wars it, it's all and then death race 2000 death race mad max inspired Games and I, I think uh, Road Warrior was late seventies. So, but but even that in respect, you know, you think back that the, so Auto Duel would have trailed that all, by only six or seven years. And and so uh, yeah, the material I definitely liked. <laughs> I, you know, I think that's a cool. Really shed some light on the game. The fact that you know somebody who really was interested in cars and knew a lot about the mechanics of actual vehicles was working on it because you know, <laughs> I can imagine it'd be totally different if you had known nothing about uh, automotives, right? Well, you know, the funny thing is, um, by that time, it took me a while to learn a few things, but by that time I had figured out that, uh, 
in terms of these games, you really have to strike a compromise between simulation and what's fun to play. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the fun to play is not a uh, realistic model then. And well, and, and possibly even today, you have the ultra realistic simulators, but frankly, I find them too difficult to play. I, I, can't, I can't play any of the race games today, but clearly they sell very well to the people that can play them. Um, but Auto Duel, no, there really was, it didn't, didn't have that much, great a bearing on, on real car dynamics. <laughs> it was just more kind of the material, I guess. Just the thought of driving around, you know, strafing with your flamethrowers and, and all. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome stuff. Uh, so you, in one of these early, early interviews, here we go again. He <laughs> says a real challenge creating that large 2D play field that you could drive around arbitrarily. That's... And you had to implement something you called a multi-tiered building block approach. I just wonder if you could elaborate a bit on, a bit on that. Yeah, basically, if I remember right, uh, the, the building blocks, it, it, so I was, I, I had to define a palette of, call them sprites, you know, walls or fences, or I don't even know what all, what various shapes we had. And that's one, one level is your individual, um, say, graphical elements. It, it, it's actually, you know, similar to, to a lot of what's, well, I don't even know if it's, necessary to take the approach anymore today but but you take the say your your building blocks but then i would take those and with the fences our our whole space was bound it, it, and, and so there were always eventually fences and so there are about 16 different blocks of, of how your fences are you know we need something that's three quarters open or one quarter open and and you define some uh series of larger building blocks that you use the sprites to build those, but then you have 16 or 32 of those and that's what you build your world with. Um, and that way you can fit it all in memory at the same time for a given, um, you know, route between two cities. I think I did, I, I, I think I was able to probably with that define the whole route and have it in memory at once. It all came down to memory constraints because, uh, you know, where there, there was no paging off the hard drive. We were paging off the floppy disk, which was incredibly slow. Um, you really could only do it during major game transitions. You couldn't do it at runtime. Um, and, and so this is the way I managed that. And, and, and actually, it's very similar to, I mean, in, in, in concept to the graphics that I use with Caverns of Callisto. So whose idea was it to put in the little toolkit that everybody <laughs> loves? I am trying to re remember. It was probably Richards. Uh, There's probably still people out there that have their toolkit, and I bet they use them for the, their PC work. I still, I, I ran came across mine just the other day. It's in the other room. Uh -oh. But but uh, at that time. What were we, I think it started with the Ultimus, that there was the maps, and uh, Richard was pushing that we need to have something special in each one of our games. So um, what was it, Ogre, that we had the little, where they, our Dallas Snell did a game that had the robots. We had lead cast robots or figures you know oh, sure yeah uh, for games there was something special in the box it was like the prize the you know the, the prize in the cereal and and auto duel we we were trying to figure so what's it going to be and and um we got the toolkits <laughs> it was appropriate where'd you get those toolkits you know i think it was just a regular uh, convention promotional regular promo house that, that you can find today and they'll do the custom prints and, and uh, that's it. Well, that's serendipity right there. Yeah. Okay, let's see. What else do we... I feel like we should talk more about Auto Duel, but I guess we pretty much... <laughs> oh, well, well, when this game came out, this was a huge hit, right? It sold really well. That, that was my really best well. seller. It was not, it's still, it's, you know, my legacy is that I was always in the shadow of the Ultima stuff. Um, so it's all relative. But uh, that was the best seller that I released. And um, it did 
when it was awarded best hybrid game, I can't buy computer gaming magazine, I think, computer gaming world. I can't even remember because we tried to bridge, We on, on purpose, what we wanted to do is bridge the role-playing versus the action um, arcade game. And I did get a, an award for that, but it sold well and people love it. I still get comments about Auto Duel. Auto Duel, that's the game that, that I've done that people remember. We get those letters from people that say that they were inspired to get into programming or <laughs> I guess maybe auto mechanics. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> But uh, so you, you got paid pretty well, so I assume you went out and got a new Ferrari. Or <laughs> I was trying to think, did I? Corvette, uh, maybe. Ironically, I am not a new guy, a new car guy. I've had a lot of used cars, and I have had several used Ferraris, which I will say the 308. It, it, I, I had several of the Ferrari 308s, the Magnum PI car, which. Today, it's one of... See, that brought it all on to me when you said the Magnum PI car. <laughs> exactly. That's a 308. But, um, yeah, you know, that's a whole... If you want to talk cars, uh, the used Ferraris, man, that's the best value out there. You, you have to spend money to keep them maintained. Maintenance is expensive, but depending on what you buy, uh, you drive it, maintain it, Sell it, take a five thousand dollars three five years later, take a five thousand dollars dollar loss, and man, you've had a Ferrari for five years. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at a new Matmobile, but <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back uh, next week with a third and final installment of this interview with Chuckles. And then after that, retrospectives. And then I have a Robert Sirotek interview coming up. So a lot of great, wonderful stuff coming up for you guys. I uh, really hope you enjoy all that and stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much. If you have supported me in my efforts to preserve video game history, if you'd like to support Matt Chat, just go to the links in the show notes. I have a Patreon site. It's by far the best way to support the show. That will also give you uh, access to some Google Air Hangouts and uh, monthly podcasts. So a lot of fun stuff. Uh, in addition to the show to enjoy. And uh, you can also support me through PayPal or whatever it is you like. Also, I uh, greatly appreciate it, guys, when you uh, post about episodes on Twitter or Facebook or uh, G+, and all of those things. It really makes a big difference, guys, and I see that, and I really, really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Uh, let's see. News. Uh, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, one good piece of news is that the Everything Kickstarter project, that was the uh, one that Jeff Williams... I was behind the uh, man responsible for Dark Star. Uh, he actually, they funded this movie, uh, just barely squeaked by, was uh, asking for 12000 got $12,585. So uh, congratulations to Jeff on that. And then also I found a really cool uh, Kickstarter today. It's already actually met its funding goal, but you can still get in on it. It's called Codemancer. And this has uh, really caught my attention. It's an educational game that teaches the magic of uh, behind programming. So it's sort of using this fantasy role-playing game uh, theme, I guess, to help kids learn how to program, or adults too. Anyway, it looked really good to me, so I thought I'd pass that along in case you wanted to uh, check it out too. Okay, so what about that Ale of the Week? Uh, well, this week I've got a... I noticed some new beers coming out from the New Belgium Brewery. They, they, uh, they're the people that make Fat Tire. You've probably seen those around. Anyway, they got this Abbey Ale now. This is a Belgian-style double ale. Clocked in at 7% uh, alcohol, so very respectable in terms of alcohol. This is, uh, these guys are out of Fort Collins, Colorado. And it's fairly well known. I've seen New Belgian stuff all over the place. So it shouldn't be too hard for you to get a hold of one of these if you, <laughs> if you want. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of New Belgium's uh, Abbey Ale here in this rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it a little bit. It's, uh, you can smell it. You know, it, it smells something like what I would expect from an Abbey Ale. It's sort of the weedy... Uh, sort of peachy like aromas you get with these. Um, however, there's also a little bit of that uh, soggy cornflakes uh, <laughs> like aroma in there too. I'm really hoping that that's not a, a, a sign of things to come. Not, not a bad aroma, but I've definitely smelled better uh, Belgian Abbey Ales. I mean, you wouldn't mistake this for the real deal. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Uh, 
Okay, so really, really good flavor on this. Uh, a lot better than I was expecting, given the aroma. Uh, quite nice, actually. Very, uh, you definitely get that Belgian flavor. It's kind of hard to describe. Sort of cherries and peaches kind of uh, uh, notes there. A little bit of, uh, maybe a little bit of bitterness, but really not much. Let me try it again. Yeah, really good. You don't really taste a lot of alcohol here. Uh, just some um, really good flavors, peaches, maybe a little bit of apricot in there. Um, the aftertaste, though, unfortunately, is that sort of cornflakes uh, like flavor you'd get from something like Budweiser or Bud Light. So <laughs> I don't know if they maybe they cut their ale a little bit with the uh, cheaper beer, but anyway, let me try it one more time. Yeah, all in all, not bad. Uh, definitely had you know, better Abbey Ale. Uh, pretty much anything from Belgium would, you know, kick this one's butt, but uh, not bad. I guess I'm going to go maybe two out of five drinking horns on this. If you uh, just happen to see this, it's not bad, but oh my god, there are <laughs> a lot better Abbey Ales out there, so, you know, be advised. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for uh, great quotes about cars, and I came across one from Bill Gates. It goes something like this. If GM had kept up with technology like the computer industry, we'd all be driving $25 cars that get 1,000 miles to the gallon. See you guys next week. What is your favorite color? Blue. No, yellow. Yeah. <laughs>